everyone. My name is Anna Turton, and I'm the Senior Commissioning Editor on the TNT Clark Theology List. The TNT Clark imprint was founded in Edinburgh in Scotland in 1821 by Thomas Clark, who planned to publish law books as well as the foreign literature books, but in 1830 they began to develop a theology list, quote, taking a progressive evangelical stance and at times publishing books that were not likely to make a profit. This year we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of the brand and we are very proud to show you how the imprint changed over the years. I think I wouldn't be far off when saying Mr. Thomas Clark would be very impressed to see that our books are making profit, are widely used and serve to thousands of students and instructors around the world. And now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the chair for our panel Professor Sir Ian Torrance, who carries a number of hats. He's a theologian, academic, Church of Scotland minister, involved with the University of Aberdeen, Princeton Theological Seminary, and an extra chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II. We all know and admire him, and, this, and with this, I pass the microphone to Ian. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, thank you. And can I introduce these uh, members of the discussion panel um, who, who are joining us? I'm first uh, Professor Hilda Costa, and she is the Associate Professor of Ecological Theology at St. Michael's College, Toronto. And she has edited books on theology, climate change, gender and equality and ecology. Um, Next, can I introduce Professor Paul Molnar, who's Professor of Systematic Theology at St. John's University in New York. He is a prolific author on Karl Barth, and in fact, he's written a lot about my father, uh, T.F. Torrance. And, um, and also we have Professor Tom Greggs, who, who holds the Marshall Chair of Divinity at the University of Aberdeen, and Tom has published a great deal on Bart and Bonhoeffer, but um, very recently he published this huge um, book on ecclesiology, um, which I recommend. And then we have Professor Anna Marie Vegan, who is the Associate Professor of Christian Social Ethics at Loyola University in Chicago. And she's the co-author of Ethnography as Christian Theology and Ethics and editor of the TNT Clark series on social ethics and ethnography. Now, what we're going to do is have a discussion for around about an hour, and then we'll have a question and answer session for about 20 minutes. Right. Um, we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of TNT Clark, as Anna said, and I'm, this is actually a great event. To put this into a kind of context, um, in 1821, when TNT Clark was founded, Walter Scott was writing his novels, and in fact, Jane Austen had died in 1817. And interestingly, in a sense, you had Jane Austen writing a kind of ethnographic novel in which she concentrated on detail. And you had Walter Scott engaging in grand narrative. Um, as Anna said, Tinty Clark massively went into uh, translation. They, they did the Nicene, post Nicene Fathers. They did a lot of German theology in the 19th century, which is forgotten now. But I mean, I have here my father's copy of Schleiermacher. And of course, as Anna said, um, Sainte Hart very bravely published um, the Church Dogmatics, uh, these great volumes. Um, can I turn to the panel uh, and, and say, you know, what comes to each of you as you think about the publishing history of Sainte Hart as we celebrate its bicentenary? Paul. Okay. Uh, well, the first thing, of course, that comes to me is the church dogmatics. Uh, the second thing that comes to me uh, would be your father's important books on the Trinity, three important books on the Trinity, Trinitarian Perspectives, 
of the Trinitarian faith and the Christian doctrine of God, one being three persons. Those are really landmark books. And the, the third thing that comes to me is the fact that things uh, are going on in a positive direction with the Cornerstone series. And so they've also republished a number of your father's works, but the works of John Webster and other important uh, books in that Cornerstone series. So I think that's a very important series. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, um, Hilda, how does this strike you? Yeah, I was thinking more of um, a, a, a recent development at CNT Clark uh, with their handbook series and um, the broad scope that they are covering. In the one hand, very foundational um, works in theology, um, either on doctrinal loci or pivotal theological figures like your father, um, but also more contemporary more recently issues like climate change um, or political theology. So there's a whole range in those handbooks that I think is quite remarkable, um, but they all are just extremely solid and thorough. No, so, um, yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, actually, we, we may well come back to discussing the role of major publishers in shaping the curriculum. And one of the ways in which they have done this is producing handbooks. Another way is putting a lot of material online, which can be read all over the world, and the shift from print to online. Um, Anna, memories of Tien Park. I can't hear her. Can you hear me now? I hear yeah. you now, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Good. my computer went to sleep apparently. So, um, well, certainly Bart, <laughs> Church Dogmatics was central to my formative education um, as a graduate student. And I just want to echo, though, what Hilda said, because as an ethicist, um, I have been so grateful for the, the broad sweeping kinds of series that are really giving so much attention to ethics. And I would just put in the chat for everybody, if you don't know about the new series, uh, the TNT Handbook of Christian Ethics Rally, not a series, but a handbook, uh, that Tobias Winwright edited. I, it's such a helpful resource. Thank you, Hilda. And Tom? Yeah, I mean, people have already covered um, so many of the books that I would want to think of as well. And I am always struck by the breadth and what Hilda said about the sort of trustworthiness of what TNT Clark publishes, which means that if you come to something on a given topic, you're assured of a very solid uh, and decent and well-researched book. I, I think for me, uh, you know, both the, the Nicene and Anti-Nicene Fathers series remains a, a really good you know, translation, even at the stage in which some of the critical apparatus has moved on. And um, Schleimacher and Bart goes without saying, but uh, I mean, my own teachers uh, published with TNT Clark, uh, John Webster's already been mentioned, but um, I, I think as well of people like Dan Hardy, who's book God's Way with the World, God's Ways with the World, I think is an extraordinarily rich book, uh, as well as the, the publications of, of, of TFT, of your, your father, Ian. I mean, I, I, it's remarkable to think of two centuries in which, you know, you have the very best people being published and some of the most important books. And, you know, the Cornerstone ser series is doing a great job in drawing attention to pieces that have been missed. Eberhard Jungel, would be one of my other people that, you know, to have access to his work in English was just extraordinary and so helpful. No, Tom, thank you. Um, these are memories of, of TNT Clark and celebrating the bicentenary. Um, the TNT Clark, I think it's fair to say, has published mainly in the Protestant tradition and clearly post-Reformation there was an explosive recovery of the Bible. And then it 
it, it interpreted the Bible through a particular grammatical framework. You had the doctrine of God, um, Christology, Soteriology, the procession of the spirit, the doctrine of the church. And this set a post-Reformation paradigm um, which, which produced a series of major figures. Now, today we are less in an era of meta-narratives, um, of major figures drawing an all-encompassing picture. Um, can I ask each of you to think about how you think theology is shifting today and particularly the interplay between um, individual studies and big picture studies. Mm -hmm. Shall we go back? Um, um, let's go back to Hilda. Yeah, I, I'm really thinking in movements. If I if I think about theology, so political theology movement, eco ecological theology movement. Um, the movement of queer theology or African American theology, and all these movements are in part shaped by contemporary issues that are not particularly theological, um, but they become theological. And what I and some of these movements, um, there's a lot of of um, these movements are ecumenical. They're not particularly within one confessional tradition. They are eclectic in, in methodology. Um, so that is, I think, a very important uh, change in the field. And another change, of course, is that we have such a rich multitude of voices today uh, from uh, traditionally underrepresented scholars, especially from the Global South. And I think that's a big change as well. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, can I actually ask um, how you the ethnographic studies coming in. I mean, I have in my hand Tim Jenkins' is, I think, great book called The Life of Property. And this was 2010, a very detailed study of identity property um, in the Bayon. But in fact, it, it is thoroughly theological because of the way it looks at kinship, um, responsibility, and identity. I think Anna can better speak to ethnography, right? So, so uh, I, I would love to hear from her on this yeah. topic. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll be talking more about kind of future trajectories and where things are going now in the field as well. There's, I, I just want to say before I, I want to respond to your original question, Ian, because I think with this proliferation of all kinds of different forms of Protestant community and thought, as well as ecumenical, as well as a lot of folks who don't identify with any particular denomination. And then more and more folks who identify as spiritual, but not religious or as nuns, you know, not, none of the above kind of thing. I think that it's a really crucial time for scholars and uh, religious intellectuals, pastoral leadership as well and such to really think about what is it that we have relevant to say right now? I mean, I, as a Lutheran, <laughs> I, I take a lot of uh, solace in knowing that Luther was an occasional writer, not a systematician, who was trying to respond to the moments in which he lived in the context. And sometimes we judge him as getting it better than others and sometimes terribly wrong. Um, but I think that right now in the United States context, some of the loudest Christian voices who are publishing online, who are doing a lot of, um, you know, huge sermons for large gatherings and such, are ones which are suspect of vaccines, are, um, are very much identified with a new kind of white nationalism, or at least um, a kind of reactive defensive whiteness. And, and I, I think that it's the onerous is on public intellectuals from a range of Protestant and Catholic uh, circles to speak meaningfully in these times and offer compelling and alternative vision of what it means to be Christian and what a Christian 
uh, what Christian categories, theological and ethical categories have to offer. In terms of ethnography, I think that there is a deep, deep uh, need to connect human experience with and have human experience speak to our theological and ethical concepts to not just apply theology and ethics to the situation, but understand that there is authentic moral and religious and spiritual knowledge coming out of particular community and having that speak back and reshape and re and at least have a dynamic conversation between between some of the perennial perennial categories and concepts and what people are living and embodying and struggling with. I also think that a key moment now in ethnography is to move beyond the paradigm of predominantly European and white uh, US folks researching other cultures and peoples and places that they don't have strong relationships with or connections to, or they're more outsiders, to doing more autoethnography, doing our own work on the people and communities that we have stronger connections and affiliation and doing self-reflection and asking those communities to do reflection on that. So I spoke too long, but those are some of the thoughts I have. You're not speaking too much and it's very valuable. And actually, as, as a person now, you know, who's retired but still reads a lot, um, the theology which I find most interesting today is coming from the directions which you have referred to. Um, um, but of course, we're also talking about publishing. And um, when you're writing evidently from a sectional point of view, you've got a smaller market and you actually have to think about how publishers manage this. Um, okay, can we go to Tom? I mean, thank you very much. Can we go to Tom? Um, because Tom has, as I said, just published this very large book on the church. And I mean, to me, this is the most profound searching book which has come out recently on the church. And it raises these questions, um, both about the big picture and the particular approaches. So Tom, what, what do you think about how theology has been done today and what we can learn from it? Thanks for the, for the overly kind words, Ian. Um, I, I mean, I, I'd like to really echo um, some of the comments that Hilda and Anna have made already, but, but perhaps give my own spin as somebody who teaches more in systematic theology and, and historical theology and ecclesiology. Um, I, I think we live in a world in which the binaries are ever more strong, you know, liberal, conservative, um, secular, sacred, high, low, um, insider, outsider, you know, this stuff has become, it, it is dominating the way in which conversation happens. And yet I'm very struck by the fact that our theology actually, and, and the, the sorts of theology that we're seeing published now is moving far beyond that into a much more complicated space that those types of binaries that you might find of you know evangelical versus catholic or liberal versus conservative just simply isn't true uh, anymore for the way that people think and i think we've got a task of trying to communicate from the academy from the sort of professional climbs of academic theology into the community um, my own way of trying to think about this in terms of the big picture is to think that we've got to probably move beyond this kind of notion of trends and um, particular methods and divisions in that to recognize that even say something like Heinz Fry's fivefold typology probably doesn't capture where things are at the moment. <clears throat> and when I talk to my own students about this, I, I, I plot this on two axes, and even this isn't um, <laughs> this isn't quite sort of sufficient. Uh, certainly not sufficient, but it, but it's a big picture context where on one axis, what, what I suggest, one end of things you have that kind of um, scholastic or neo-scholastic approach that either thinks that the activity is ever deeper engagement in a figure or a particular metaphysical approach or a particular set of commitments, and if we recover that in some way, or if we get to an ever greater degree of precision then we've done our theological task well. And at the other end of that axis might be sort of theologia semper reformanda or something, or a you know, theology past metaphysics where people are asking these 
kind of constructive searching questions and think that there might be a corrective enterprise. So you've got that going on, it seems to me, on one axis. And then on the other axis, you've got kind of locus and person approaches. The task of theology is done dominantly through attention to several loci or a particular dominant um, person. You know, we've mentioned some of those people already who have been key for the way that we think theologically today. And at the other end of that axis, you've got axis, you've got the kind of um, the sort of movement stuff that Hilda was talking about, or the theology and uh, enterprises, or the discussions with identity and community, and, and people have a kind of complex relationship as to where they might be on those different axes, you know, whether they're approaching this by, by a kind of recovery or a critical enterprise, whether they're wanting to reclaim figures or traditional loki, or look at kind of contemporary issues and cultural contexts. And, and, and I think as a result of that, that we actually have an immensely um, variegated and broad um, um, voice that we can offer as theologians, um, where there are complex relationships and actually complex um, interactions and alliances between particular approaches uh, and particular issues going through in a way that's broken out of those old camps. And I think some of that is because of a recognition of the complexity of the world, of a, a complexly um, multi-religious and secular world in which we live, and, and because of an awareness of the need for theology to speak prophetically into the contexts um, that we find ourselves in, um, so, and, and to listen, actually, to the prophetic voices of others. So, so that would be my kind of, that's my broad picture way of thinking about things on these two, two axes. I don't know whether that's helpful for, for anybody else or how true that might be, but, but that's at least how I, I talk to my own students about it. Yeah, well, Tom, that's extremely helpful. Um, Paul, Paul, um, Paul, how, how do you see this? Um, I mean, in, in a sense, the, the question at the moment is um, the dialogue between big picture thinking, as it were, and um, looking at particular figures and particular issues, and rather than schools, we're looking at movements. Um, but how do you understand um, your own work and how you see theology developing and what you try to teach? I think you're muted, Paul. Before somebody else would, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now unmuted. Um, so, I guess I was going to start with what I did in class this morning. I was using uh, Daniel Migliori's book, Faith Seeking Understanding, where he was yep. talking. Great book. Where he was talking about theological method in the first chapter. And um, he, he, he says he's going to follow Karl Barth's method, this Christocentric method. And I explain to the students that Colbert didn't sit around one day and say, what kind of a method should I adopt? Should I be a Christocentric theologian or, or should I adopt some other method? And I explained to them that his theology was Christocentric because he was thinking about God within the context of the Nicene Creed. Uh, and then uh, what I do in class is I have a handout with Thomas Aquinas' commentary on the Creed where he explains uh, why it's important to understand Jesus as, as the unique son of God correctly. So, and he then goes on to reject the, the views of Photinus, Sibelius, and Arius. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, Migliori also brings in uh, Paul Tillich's correlation method and uh, David Tracy's revisionist method, and then the method of liberation theology. And, and so I basically, I, I don't know if this could be heretical, <laughs> to some folks, <laughs> but I basically said that uh, I think he's going to have problems trying to blend Karl Barth's Christocentric method with Tillich's correlation method, Tracy's method, and the method of liberation theology, because, uh, for example, one uh, modern liberation theologian said, following Gustavo Gutierrez's statement, that the subject of liberation theology is liberation, not theology. And what I want to say to that is, well, 
you can't do a proper liberation theology unless it's theologically grounded. So that you, so so for example, we work against oppression and for liberation of others as Christians because God in Christ has liberated us from the sin that leads to oppression. And so if we're living in that freedom, then this is what we would do. But if you begin with liberation, then liberation means we just use Jesus as a model or or or, or a means to get to our political, social, and religious ends, which may be totally untheological and extremely problematic. Uh, and then, uh, then if you go, then I looked at the, I, I said to the students, I said, uh, Daniel Miliuri seems to think uh, in the book that uh, Paul Tillich did not give over revelation to experience, right? He didn't, he didn't allow it to be uh, normed by experience. So as an example, I took a, a paragraph from his book, The Shaking of the Foundations, where he says to, to his congregation that if you don't like the traditional meaning of the word God, clearly that comes to us through the Nicene Creed, right? Uh, then translate it and speak of the depths of your life or of what you take seriously as of ultimate concern. And my reaction to that is the depths of my life are still my life. It, it, you know, I'm, there's nothing in me that's divine that I can rely on um, in that way. I can't equate experience of depth with knowledge of God. And that's exactly what he did. He says, using depth psychology, we can say that if you have an experience of depth, you know much about God. And what I showed the students was when I put the two um, sets of views up on the board, uh, uh, up on the, the screen. One was Tillich's statement of explaining God with the experience of depth, and the other was Colbert's interpretation of God based within the context of the Nicene Creed as the Eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, it, it was clear that Tillich didn't, didn't, his thinking wasn't shaped by who God was in Jesus Christ. His thinking wasn't shaped in the form of faith-seeking understanding as faith in the Word of God being driven to understanding. It was really faith in the experience of death being led to understanding. So, so I, I was trying to explain to the students that Karl Barth and Paul Tillich never quite came to agreement because Barth always thought Tillich's theology was more a philosophy than a theology. And I, and I basically said to them that um, that I think that the doctrine of the Trinity, and here I agree with your father, who said uh, that, that, that if you hold any doctrine apart from the doctrine of the Trinity, it becomes seriously malformed. I, 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 I actually agree with that. And, and so, so the, my point is then that however important experience is, and it's very important, obviously, uh, the truth of, of what we know about God and ourselves and about revelation and grace and faith and the doctrine of justification and so forth, the truths, those truths don't come from us in our experiences whether they be religious or not, they actually come to us in our encounter with the word of God. And another, I gave one other example that was a little sharp. I, I said, uh, if people could rely on themselves uh, to know the truth that comes through faith in Jesus Christ as the word, then how would we explain the cross? The fact is that, that those Jews who relied on their cultural perspective at the time of Jesus ended up handing him over to the Romans who might have been relying on their cultural perspectives and together he was crucified he was rejected but if he is the very word of god come to reconcile the world and we're directly confronted by god in him then that shows that humanity really does need reconciliation before we can speak rightly about god and about humanity and and theolo theology in general so that's that's the approach that i take um, yeah. and I, I also think that the doctrine of the trinity i've always thought this um if there's ever going to be real substantial unity between Catholics and Protestants, it would be as that as their thinking is ground and behavior is grounded in the proper understanding of the Trinity. That's yeah. Paul, um, <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, we and I, I may come back to Hilda and Anna in in a sense for some reaction, but um, I remember obviously we all know that T.G. Clark have published on Bible as well as theology. Um, I actually began teaching New Testament and patristics, and um, I'm looking at the anti publications. You know, I, I remember early on reading uh, Sandy and Headlam's commentary in the ICC on Romans, and then it moved to Cranfield, 
Um, do any of you have any thoughts about how um, Bible study has evolved in the last 40 years? I mean, as a beginner, I would, as a starter to this conversation, um, I think of the shift to sociological analysis, sociological appropriation of scripture, and the understanding of the Jewishness of Jesus. Um, but um, can I turn this over to, to the others of you? Um, I mean, Hilda, can I come back to you? Um, how has Bible study changed in, in your academic lifetime? That is a very broad question. Um, I can only speak about um, my own trajectory with scripture. Uh, um, I'm coming from a Protestant tradition, from uh, was uh, born and raised in the Netherlands, yeah. then studied at Princeton Seminary for a year, and did my PhD at the University of Chicago, and now I'm teaching in Toronto after uh, a stint, at um, a long one, at a Lutheran college in Minnesota. So um, I've gone um, it, but in and between many traditions and many different ways of relating to scripture. But for me, um, important developments have been feminist scholarship on scripture. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so the retrieval, the rereading of the text uh, from the perspective of gender and, um, and also the critical retrieval of the text. So the kind of distance that you feel between the, yourself and the text because the text comes from such a very different context. In, um, um, and lately, my work has focused on uh, ecology and the green reading of scripture. And, uh, and I've been especially struck by um, the way we have adapted methodologies in the first half of the 20th century that were so incredibly anthropocentric and actually kind of reading against the um, earth spirituality of the text itself. Uh, so really blinding us, uh, if I can use that metaphor, for, um, for the rich sacramentality of the text. So I think that that is an enormous important shift in contemporary scholarship for the area that I'm now working on in, and that is the area of ecological theology and ethics. And there's a huge interest among students in this as well. Um, um, so yeah, I, I leave it there. Yeah, actually, this is extremely interesting. Um, <clears throat> if one looks at cosmology, which has been of interest to theologians, uh, at one stage in cosmology, people made a great deal of what they called the cosmic anthropic principle. In a sense, it all revolved around the human person. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that um, there was a similar move in ecological thinking at one stage, and we've moved out of that. I mean, would you like to comment on that? I mean, I think really, in a sense, you've said this. It's, it's a great move forward that we're not so centered upon ourselves. Right. Um, I, I, would, I would say that um, there is, a, there is in, in, the, in the very reading of the Old Testament, for instance, that we read, um, uh, we create a, 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 an opposition between uh, the world of the Israelites and the Umwelt in terms of, especially in terms of the issue of relating to the land. Um, but that, that opposition is very much driven by um, the, 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 uh, the, the hesitation of, uh, towards, um, around natural theology in the first half of, this, of the 20th century and how that influenced biblical scholarship. Um, similarly, I mean, something if Paul ref, uh, was, was uh, referring to his own teaching. Um, I was teaching last night and it was uh, my first class. Um, and I was just uh, reflecting on Genesis 1 and how we have read Genesis 1 always uh, with an extremely anthropocentric orientation that it is all about the creation of, of the human and uh, how important it is to decenter that. It is about the Sabbath, about God's rest. 
and uh, so it's a liturgical text. Um, but also, uh, why would it be about us? Um, we, um, you know, but if, if anything, the text tells us that we are dependent on everything else. Uh, we ha are the, probably the most vulnerable of God's creations. Um, so that kind of shift in reading, I think, is incredibly important. That doesn't answer your question, <laughs> Ian, it but I it took it that It doesn't matter. We're not looking for final answers. Um, can I turn to Anna, the Bible and you? Well, <laughs> um, I, I am not a, I am not as versed as others in biblical theology or in biblical ethics. Um, I just want to echo some of what Hilda has said. I, I agree a lot. I, and to Paul, I think that my perspective is in this, these questions are that, I mean, I don't have a Bluetooth or a USB port in my head, so I have no direct revelation just coming in to me from the divine. For me, all knowledge, including biblical understanding, is mediated through experience, through, I mean, Bart, Bart is not even having a universal perspective. He just didn't own it as his own perspective. He's not speaking for all time. He might be Christocentric, but it's still his interpretation of who Christ is. And I think that, mm -hmm. so I have come to a time of much more humility in my readings of scripture and these theological concepts, knowing that, that all are partial understandings and all are situated in particular times, places, bodies, perspectives. And we all have limits of vision. You know, none of us get 360 vision. Um, so we need one another to try and widen our scopes. And I, as somebody noted in the chat, and it's related to publishing and non-English speaking as the first language, but I just want to acknowledge that the center of gravity of Christian theology and ethics is shifting away quite quickly from Europe and, and yeah. the United States. <clears throat> and it's... It's not North America or or um, Europe. And it's this two thirds world, and those embodied experiences and interpretations and context. So I, we have to really grapple with that, and learning about those shifts and and not being the center <laughs> anymore. I was teaching this morning about scripture, actually scripture and ethics, in the sense that the class I'm co-teaching with an anthropologist is on how both the sciences and Western white Christianity have been used to enable race, racism in the sciences and medicine and in theology. So it's a capstone. And so we were looking at Genesis through the lens of colonialization and defenses of slavery. So I think that, you know, we, that is essential work. And, and also through our, the ways that we interpret scriptures that are anti-Semitic. I think we need to own that and address that if we really hope to have strong relationships with um, people in Judaism and in other religious traditions. So I think we have a lot of self-critical, self-reflection work to do right now in biblical scholarship, but in other areas as well. Okay, no, thank you. Um, can I come to Paul? Paul, are you? And your question today is about the function of the Bible, I guess. Right? Well, yeah, well, it's actually not just the function of the Bible, but also how in your teaching career you have seen Bible study change, biblical scholarship change, and, and um, because there have been very large changes. Yes, well, of course, since Vatican II, from the, from the Catholic side, we, we, we will, we do acknowledge now formally, right, that scripture has a, a normative function in theology. Uh, now, whether whether those in authority will will, will grant the fact that uh, for, I think of your your father's famous article in uh, in the Irish Theological Quarterly on on truth and theology, where he says if we allow the truth of being to be the criterion of what we think and say, then then we wouldn't lodge that truth in the magisterium, however important the magisterium is. So, so of course, that's very important. And many of my colleagues actually do allow their thinking to be shaped 
uh, by the Bible in ways that, that, that enable them to critique certain perspectives on Roman Catholic authority now. So I think that's a good thing. Um, so, so obviously there is authority in the church, uh, uh, but the, but as Bart once said, the teaching church is the listening church and the listening church should also be the teaching church at any given time. So, so, but uh, I guess I would like to come, say a couple of things uh, back to my class this morning and, and then Daniel Miliori's book. Uh, where, where in that first chapter in theolo on theological method, he says, there are two roots for the quest of faith. One is God, who is a living subject and not, not an object that we can manipulate, which we would all agree with, uh, possibly, at least I, I, would, I agree with it. Um, and the other root of theology is the signification of faith. And he finishes that little paragraph off where he says that the situation of faith, the context in which we live, which everyone's obviously referring to here uh, uh, is also a source of theology and many of the things that we believed centuries ago in light of that fact are no longer relevant today the problem with that is that uh, i think that if theology is taken seriously as faith in the word of god seeking understanding then then you can't marginalize jesus and his uniqueness with the idea that it was, maybe Bart was interpreting one way, but we can interpret him in a wider way. And, and when I use the word wider, I'm thinking of uh, Gordon Kaufman, who basically says said in his work, we should we should um, just flat out admit that the that the the confession that Jesus is utterly unique uh, is is not helpful today anymore. It leads one set of one group to dominate another. No, it doesn't. It's sinners who who try to dominate others. It's in Christ, if we were really thinking about him for who he was as as the incarnate word and the reconciler and revealer, he, he would actually bring us together. He would not lead us to pit ourselves one against another. And and I think of Paul Nitter, who basically uh, says that in a pluralistic world, we can no longer believe in Jesus and his uniqueness. Now, he's perfectly free to believe that, and so is anyone else. But but here's my point. The point is that uh, that... If you just say it's Bart's interpretation of Christ that he's presenting, it makes it sound like he's pre projecting his vision onto Christ, and that's the basis of his uniqueness. But Bart spent a lot of ink rejecting that view because that's what he called Ebionite Christology, trying to ground Christ's uniqueness in, our, in the community's response to him. Because if that were true, then he wouldn't be unique at all. So, so the, the point is, in, when it comes to the question of truth, I happen to agree with Karl Barth that there's really only one root of theology, and that's God as he meets us. Or as Colin Gunton once said uh, uh, in conversation with another professor who had just read a book entitled The God I Want, and we get a lot of that today, it's quite obviously, right? He said, there was a book of essays. Uh, I think it was either Colin Gunton or the other professor who said to him, he said, I cannot imagine a sillier enterprise than writing a book entitled The God I Want, because it's not the God I want, but the God you're damn well going to get. So the, the point being that, that we can't change God and Christ based on people's reactions to God and Christ um, without actually distorting the truth of who God is. And the fact that, the, and the positive point there is that because God is who God is, when he actually does free us to love God and love our neighbors, it has a power to it that it wouldn't otherwise have. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. It does. It does, Paul. Thank you. Um, can I come to Tom? Thanks. I mean, this is a topic I feel very passionately about, um, the, the, the way in which scripture functions within the theological enterprise. And I sort of listening to the conversation so far, find myself kind of convinced by both sides and wanting to yeah. find a a route through in the middle, which, which I think for me is about the one of the things that I think has maybe transformed from my being a student. I mean, I remember my first ever tutorial uh, as an undergraduate student being told to go away and write 4,000 words on the synoptic problem. And having been a, a classicist, I didn't know what a synoptic was and I didn't know that there was a problem with it. So I was I was somewhat <laughs> confused. But, but it seemed to me that a lot of the, the way that I learned biblical studies focused on 
the technicalities, the precision, the Erklärungen component of what we were doing. And that's obviously vitally important. You know, that's that's the kind of solid, grounded, academic, careful engagement with the text. But I think what we've, at least I feel in my, throughout the course of my 25 years or so of doing this, um, what's what's changed has been a, a, a renewed confidence. And, and I actually see this as coming from people like Bart, a renewed confidence to hear the viva vocens of scripture, the living voice of scripture, and to see scripture therefore as a datum to be used, recognizing that when we read it, we read it um, as interpretants within a community of interpretation, whether that's a creedal interpretation or with a creedal interpretation, other, other interpretations as well, and that scripture meets us as it speaks about itself in a way that can uh, uh, cut through as uh, like a sword. And, and I, I think one of the things that I've noticed in the way that um, engagement with the Bible has operated is that whereas at least when I felt like I was training, it was everybody was in their sort of silos and you dursn't ever go near to the New Testament if you're working in systematics or, um, you know, yeah. so on and so forth. <laughs> the capacity to really work together um, across these disciplinary um, uh, divisions and specialisms. You know, I think about my own institution where in the last couple of years we've had a seminar, uh, systematics has shared a seminar with Hebrew Bible twice, once on the concept of monotheism in Hebrew scripture and theology and another on Schleimacher's hermeneutics, or where with the New Testament people we've done and the ethicists, we've looked at Luther's commentary on Genesis. Uh, and we've tried to come at these texts recognizing that, um, it, you know, the people who are experts in these texts realize that these continue to be read in an authoritative way and, and that actually that authoritative way can be disruptive at times of things that we presume that the bible has said or things that we've elided through scripture when the pattern is much more complicated and actually uh, much more liberative of us um i i think there is a real you know i mean what for example one of the things i'm struck by very often is that in mark's gospel jesus uses whenever a woman does something it's the imperfect tense that's used and when a man does it's an aorist tense you know there's a recognition of the faithfulness of the women going through the text which which has something it seems to me to say really profoundly about some of these fundamental questions that the church has asked and continues to ask about issues to do with gender for example and we've elided that and not discussed that as, a, as an issue and that sort of presence so i think that the, the that capacity is really um, shaping the discipline and then within New Testament and Old Testament studies as well, narrative approaches to the text have become really important and, and ways sometimes of bridging that gap between theological and historical study, a recognition through people like Tony Thistleton of the, the significance of hermeneutics and the way in which we yeah. Um, yeah. engage in state, <clears throat> all of this stuff, as well as reading texts with Jewish people, and with Muslim people, the sort of stuff that's happened in script, scriptural reasoning. I mean, I've actually found that often I'm really um, I'm drawn up short by reading the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible with Jewish colleagues, particularly, who come to these texts with completely different um, presumptions uh, and with the same sense that this is authoritative and have learned so much from that context. And I guess that's fed into the importance of things like Second Temple Judaism for a way of understanding Paul and New Testament studies. So, I, I mean, I, I think, and I think TNT Clark's had a really important role in that, that we've actually managed to get to a place where rather than it being sort of different departments within one faculty, we, we can actually begin to learn from each other and, and engage with each other about this text, which is not only interesting historically, but authoritative and powerful today in the way in which it might be uh, understood and read through the guidance of the Spirit as a testimony to Jesus Christ. Um, Tom, actually, thank you for all of that. I, I, I absolutely support all of this. And I do know that in, in Aberdeen with Grant McCaskill, who I think is a really profound, really interesting New Testament scholar, he's got a seminar on church, Bible and autism. And yes. the, these are raising contemporary questions out of text, um, but engaging with where people are. Yeah. Um, and actually, I, I, I 
extremely supportive of this way of approaching scripture, as well as analyzing the text very hard. Um, I keep an eye on the time. Um, here, here's a question. I'm, I'm actually going to control this rather tightly because there is another question I want to ask before we hand over to question and answer. Um, how do we how do we teach today and not monopolize the curriculum? I mean, here we are in in you know in Britain and the UK. Uh, sorry, in Britain and the US. Um, I mean, what are ways in which um, um, we we can stop this monopolizing? Um, let, let me go first to Anna, if I may. And you, you're muted, I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, I guess I, my undergraduates don't understand. I mean, there's a lot of translation. We can't ex assume any kind of common vocabulary. I teach at a Jesuit university in Chicago that has students from, again, every religious background and none, and and people in all kinds of combinations of discernments. and so. I rarely assign one whole book of anyone to them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm much more likely to ask them to read chapters and articles that are online, um, or I scan them, and also uh, increasingly podcasts and short videos and giving them some options for ways of engaging. So I think that we have to, I, I guess I would just say that the task is to connect some pretty powerful theological and ethical concepts with where they are <laughs> and do the art of translation and uh like today even we were talking about colonialization and genesis and such and i found myself saying well lil nas x has a very provocative take on genesis if you've seen call me by your name music video not not something i thought i would ever bring up as an illustration but it it it, it connected so all that is to say is that I think I'm paraphrasing Dorte Sole when she wrote, I believe, that theology is meant to address a wound, speak to a wound. The heart, yeah. and so that that's what we have to do. So I, I just think that I I have to meet students where they are to start a conversation and in mediums that they can access and understand. Um, no, thank you. Um, and actually, I think that's a brilliant answer because I think theology today is not just textbook or, or, or guides, um, but it is using videos, blogs, podcasts, and, and all the other ways in which more immediate access can be made to where people are doing theology locally. Um, can I come to Hilda? Quickly, I'm, I'm sort of going to stop this in a couple, two or three minutes, so we can come to the last question. Um, but Hilda, what, do you have any any thoughts about this and the monopolization of the curriculum and how we can do it better? Yeah, Donna Haraway says, you know, it matters which thoughts think thoughts, which knowledges tell knowledges, uh, which stories tell stories. And I, I find that very profound in a way. Um, so who is it that we bring into our syllabus, and what is the status that we gave those that we give those voices? I think for many years, those of us who are interested in diversifying our syllabi have just basically thought uh, mainstream white male theology, and then add on the voices of the margin. And I think what you see now in theology is a reversal and a rethinking of that. Uh, how can we kind of envision culture and knowledge systems that are not that have not been traditionally mainstream and bring them into uh, our, our of use them as lenses for, for what we are going to teach? So the, the the attempt is really to decolonize the, the curriculum, to decolonize our syllabi. And that is a is a difficult and interesting task 
Um, but it's very rich. And I think the examples that Anna gave are a good example of, of exactly that task. Thank you. Um, no, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to come now to the, the last question. Um, and th this question actually is as we celebrate 200 years of TNT Clark, um, do we have any advice to give to TNT Clark as it enters its third century? And actually, I want to start this, if, if I may, myself, you know, having edited Scottish Journal Theology for whatever it was, 34 years. Um, I, I, and this is, in a sense, speaking, I think, particularly to Anna. Um, my advice to TNT Clark is to trust younger scholars. I mean, absolutely crucial to encourage the, the next generation um, and to believe their instincts and to encourage them, to give them space. That's one thing. And the other is to have editors who are hungry for the big picture. And as I think of TNT Clark over 40 years, in the 80s and 90s, Jeffrey Green was the editor of TNT Clark. And he was a very good editor. He had a very good eye for what was happening. And he's courageous in picking out good books. And he expanded things. And, um, you know, Anna is doing it now. And I'm actually, this will embarrass her. I'm full of praise what Anna does. Um, so these are people who have big pictures. That's what I recommend. But let me go through you all and we will. We've got another sort of eight minutes before question and answer. Um, Tom, what do you think about this? What advice would you give to TNT Clark as, as they continue? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I like, as somebody who considers themselves to be a progressive evangelical, I like the idea of a prophetic, of a progressive evangelical stance with which it was founded. And I think, I think there's different ways of imagining how that is. I think that there is this kind of trustworthiness to to what TNT Clark does as well as and simultaneous to the risk taking you know that they yeah. they are going to be at the forefront of things and i hope that that continues and i think lots of that is actually as you say in you know because of trusting younger scholars and i'm really pleased that TNT Clark continues to publish uh, revised dissertations yeah because actually yeah. some of the most exciting stuff that comes out um yeah. And then, you know, keeping up, I mean, the other two things just to say briefly, keeping the breadth of what they do up, you know, I love going to the stand and just thinking, okay, well, I can see some really interesting Catholic stuff, biblical stuff, you know, um, social ethics stuff, um, identity orientated discussions, the, the, the breadth is really commendable, you know, it's part of that progressiveness that I think is key. And, and, and then to sort of piggyback on what you said, the relationships, I mean, my my view of what is really special about TNT Clark is that they develop relationships with people, which I think um, puts trust in them and enables them to do the best work that they can do. And if I think back through the people who've been editors while I've been working, you know, that's been true of everyone. And it is supremely true in Anna, actually, who is extremely highly thought of because she does bother to think, to get to know us and to find out what we're doing and what's going on. Tom, thank you. Paul. Yes. Uh, well, I, I worked with Jeffrey Green, so I quite agreed with the things. Yeah. That, I agree with the things that you said, uh, and but uh, and I've worked uh, with Anna, and I think she, she's a superb editor because she has a wide view of what theology should look like. She she she's willing to publish important um, books on important timely topics, and she is willing to go to younger scholars, but she has uh, she has a good sense of what solid sh theology should look like. And so she's uh, she, she's rigorous in her judgments about what is, what, is, what is worth publishing and what, what isn't. And that's one of the reasons why T T. Clark publications are so well received and, and, and so useful to, to people. So, so uh, I personally uh, have, have uh, very much enjoyed working with Anna over the years. And I, I think she's doing a great job. Thank you. Um, Hilda. Your yeah, I, I really advice. agree with that. I am also extremely appreciative of the work that Anna is doing and the trust that she puts in scholars that she works with. Um, 
she has asked me to do things that I thought, really? Uh, and uh, and that has, you know, given me tremendous opportunity to edit a handbook, to edit a book series. Um, the work on technology, the digital digital publishing, I think is really important that uh, that TNT Clark is doing and is really a leader on. It's very important, especially also for smaller schools, for colleges and, and seminaries. Um, so that's extremely important work, and I hope that we'll continue to do that. It's very enough, uh, very important work. And highlighting global voices. I, I'm saying it again, but underrepresented voices, I think, is, is important. TNT Clark is doing that, and I'm really, I'm really applauding that, uh, that work. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just quickly echo all of what you said. I agree, and to it, I would simply add that, um, I mean, if there's one thing we've learned because of COVID-19, there are ways of connecting online. You know, we can have this conversation instead yeah. of all trying to get together at AAR or whatever, although we can do that too. And I think that hopefully that can help us keep thinking creatively and imaginatively, TNT Clark, about how to cultivate conversation and relationships with these emerging scholars from the two thirds world. And we start, they're doing that, they're starting to, you know, they're committed, but I think we really need to make more inroads in those relationships in universities and seminaries and colleges and, and try to facilitate those conversations. The other thing I would say, and I'm not a super pro at this, maybe we need more millennials. I think TNT Clark has some on staff, but how do we maximize marketing through social media and visuals and short audio with or video interviews with folks or you know something that can be on twitter or can be done in ways that aren't just the the ways that i grew up with in terms of marketing i feel like we need to think more forward about marketing and i also think we need and this is hard because the academia academia is so very much focused on monographs and on print books and you know and and we measure people for tenure and things like that based on that but i really think we need to think about how we communicate with a wider public and what kinds of articles and op-eds and formats or different kinds of again blogs websites can work to to have more conversations with with interested folks in a wide variety of vocations um i just want everybody to know who's here that this series if you are interested in exploring more on ethnographies this is our series with TNT Clark. And in particular, we are focused on uh, an, an, an contextualizing race for the next three years. And if you know of anybody who's working on those kinds of topics, I'm just asking you to have them get in touch with me or one of the other series editors. We have our own website that says more about that series. So I've just put those two links in the chat. Okay. Um, Anna, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I, I'm actually looking at the, the questions that have come up in the in the chat. Um, Anna actually has asked how important are the digital resources for your teaching and what could we do better? Uh, actually, before I pass that, for very quick comments to all of you, um, I, I actually believe passionately that there must be good dialogue between the publishing houses and faculty because um, how we form a curriculum is an ongoing discussion, and it takes these two people, these two sides. But how do others of you relate to the digital resources that TNT Clark is producing? Any quick comments? I think the digital resources are extremely useful um, because you you can go across a subject in, in, from many different angles uh, and it can be done, you can just click on links to get there and you don't, you don't have to thump through 30 different books. So, so, so like the digital encyclopedia, the Christian encyclopedia, I think is a terrifically useful tool. So I think it's a great idea. And it can be used in class. Yeah, yeah. Um... And, and very big projects. I mean, the the, um, the digital Karl Barth, which was a collaboration with Princeton. Um, I see that Phil Ziegler has asked, 
if panelists might be willing to comment on the challenges and prospects of publishing non-English theological work in translation in today's academic and publishing environment. Any thoughts about this? More non-English work being translated. Uh, maybe Ian, could I, could I come in uh, if, if that's yeah. okay? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think, you know, I think this is an, uh, a really an enviable time to be a publisher. Um, because of the different formats, and this probably, you know, this probably relates both questions together. I mean, my my experience of undergraduates is that increasingly they won't take the time to really go through a text in detail to find what they want because they're used to search functions and they read differently to the way that that we do. And and actually, digital texts are really important on that front. And my experience of postgraduates is that they don't have the language capacities that we once just sort of expected. And, and took for granted, um, and you know, I think I think that there is a real need to um, engage in the translation work for two principal reasons. I mean, one is how do we decolonialize our curricula if we don't have the work there in a format and a form and a language that people can translate, and that's probably a colonial activity in and of itself. But you know, there th there is a a struggle there not just to have this kind of sense of oriental other but to really engage and try and inhabit with these different different perspectives and, and, and then i think there are lots of texts that we're missing simply because you know we don't have the sorts of language capacities i mean one of the great joys of ecumenism has been a rediscovery of the east and there's so many orthodox texts that we don't have um similarly you know um eastern european texts people like Klutka, who you know yeah. who've written really important works yeah um in in 1992 in fact a history was written of tnt Hall, um believe it or not by a person called john dempster and it was called the tnt Hall story and um actually that shows to an extent that i had not known before how TNT Park had really gone into translation of German theology in the 19th century. I mean, when I think of TNT Park's translations, um, I, I, I go back to, to Schlamacher. But mm -hmm. it was, they, they really got into the debate, the critical debate about Jesus. Um, so TNT, TNT Park has translation um, as part of its DNA. And um, cultural translation and cultural enablement may be, may be part of its next stage. Um, we're actually doing quite well for time, and um, there haven't been a huge number of comments on the, that I can see in the chat. So actually, um, you know, we want to have a 10. I think Anna also just asked us to comment on what we see as the biggest issues that theology and biblical studies should address. Okay, that's good. Right, let's take it in turn. Um, Anna, what do you think? <laughs> um, well, I, I really think that, as I said before, we need to attend to the most critical wounds because if we, as theologians and ethicists and biblical scholars, don't have something relevant and constructive to say, then I'm not sure why we're doing what we're doing. So for me, as Hilda has done important work um, and others as well uh, from TNT Clark, to address the ecological destruction and the climate crisis and to offer uh, hope and also moral imagination and what we have to offer from our theological and biblical and moral traditions to navigate this long era that we are entering after leaving the Holocene into the Anthropocene, I think that's a, that's a game changer. So that's a big one. And bound up in that is inequity, gender, race, class, uh, sexual identity, um, national origin, religious marginalization, all of these things, because climate change exacerbates and intensifies all of these other kinds of inequities. So um, I think we have a lot to do right there. And we have a lot to do to show 
what kind of theological, biblical, and ethical resources we have. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I. Yes, indeed. Now, do you put this into some kind of apocalyptic framework? On my bad days, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I. This is epic changing. We are living a really critical moment in the arc of history, not just human history, but geologic history. So um, we are all going to be dead for many, many, many years before we know really how we've all come out as a species. Yeah. So all we can do is hope that what we do plants enough seeds for future generations to navigate with meaning and viability. Thank you. Hilda, Hilda what? Yeah, I, I could not um, agree more and um, uh, that this that we at, uh, at um, the University of Toronto, of the, the Toronto School of Theology, we started a virtual forum last um, year. That's an international forum and it is doing theology in times of epical shift. And so we have been meeting on all these big issues that Anna is talking about, climate injustice, climate vulnerability, the Anthropocene, um, and so on. Um, with the, the, and also apocalypse. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's that sense that if our theology cannot address the tremendous planetary challenges that we're facing today, uh, then indeed, what is it that we are doing? Um, so uh, there is an urgency, I would say, to doing theology and to draw on the wisdom of the ages to address or give at least offer resources for uh, for a time like this in which we are literally running out of time. Um, so yeah, so so theology is, in my opinion, uh, extremely important. It has not been more important, probably. Actually, that that itself is is a crucial statement because you believe in the future of the discipline, and you believe that doing theology has public importance. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I think all of us believe that, but it is worth stating. But and I, but to me, is so interesting is that I see people who are public figures on issues like climate change, for instance, Naomi Klein. I see them turn to spiritual traditions and really kind of calling on the faith communities to step up and to um, uh, to draw on on their resources to um, to kind of create the the chains of heart that uh, that and, and start the healing that uh, that we really need to you know to think different to imagine differently. Um, and that is the work I think that theologians do. Yeah, um, and of course the ecumenical patriarch has done a great deal on this. Oh, tremendous! Uh, yeah, he has, and, and actually so too has the King of Jordan. Um, yes. King, King we, of have Jordan. Another, we have another um, question from Marty, by the way, also before we run out. Um, of Marty Folsom. Okay. Um, what can I? The question? Martin, okay. Um, as open academic teaching positions decline, how do we shape students and publishing to create sustainable, valuable roles to further the enterprise? Theological schools on the west coast of the US are closing as they are marginalized in a culture which is deaf to theological thinking. Um, actually, let me turn that. That's a good question. And um, while I you know, having had nine years in Princeton, I can understand. Um, let me come, Paul, um, to you, if you don't mind. Um, how are your students, but very few of whom are going to become academic theologians, how do they carry on this critical engagement? It's a, it's a really good question. Uh, the, some of my graduate students, um, when when they uh, see what good systematic theology is and does, uh, when we when we do when we analyze the doctrine of the Trinity and what and and Christology and and especially the doctrines of justification by faith 
and so on. Um, two two crucial things they pick up on. Number one, uh, we we are not the ones who are going to save the world, but we can point out that it, insofar as we live from the one who can save the world in union with Christ, for example, right, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then act in accordance with what we what the freedom that's ours there, then then we can work for the coming of the kingdom of God, and therefore, uh, you know, f- the betterment of things, as we say in New York City, you know, locally and 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 ge- and and around the world, right? Not only in New York City, but around around the world. So all of these things. Uh, ecology and so on and so forth, equality, they're all extreme, and anti-racism, these are all extremely important issues, but if they simply become, uh, uh, an, um, an, uh, if you simply become an ideologue with those issues, right, trying to force people to behave in accordance with a set of ideals that we may want to impose on them, I think all is lost. So one of the, so my graduate students really, actually when I have them read some of your father's works, they really love it because uh, it's like uh, a colleague of mine, a priest who's been teaching with us for 35 years. One summer he said, do you know any good books on Christology that I could read? So I recommended your father's two works on the Incarnation and Atonement. And the next fall when I when I came back, he, did, he read them during the summer. He said, how come I was never taught Christology like this when I was in the seminary? And of course, I had been in the same seminary that he was in. And uh, we shared the view that the person teaching Christology <laughs> didn't do very good Christology at the time, you know. It was just a kind of, he was an ideologue imposing his views of Jesus on other people, which is not very free. So my students love that. And some of them have gone on to study for the PhD. After, we, we only have a master's program at St. John's. Now, as far as the undergraduates go, I've had some, uh, me, th- that's a required course at St. John's, right? So most of them come in, uh, having to take it only because they have to take it. But when I get them interested in the issues and, and show them how uh, serious theology can lead to new insights and really change people's lives, not because we change their lives, but because in relying on God and being faithful to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, God actually can work through us to do that. Uh, they, they, like, they like that. They, they find that very freeing. So, so I've had some, I had one undergraduate who was going to go to law school at Fordham once, and she did. She went up to, to, go, to get into the, to go to law school at Fordham, and for some reason, she couldn't start the program right away. <clears throat> so her first course was with Elizabeth Johnson. <laughs> and so this was around the time that my first book on the Trinity came out, and I had a chapter raising some questions to Elizabeth Johnson's work. So she, she was in class uh, raising some of those questions, and and Elizabeth Johnson, who I've met, is a lovely person. She she responded to her saying, uh, she said, I'd like to see that book. Where did you get those questions from? So she got into a, a dialogue with her. And I tried to advise the students, you know, not to be so uh, firm, you know, <laughs> in pushing against Elizabeth Johnson, because I said, you really don't want to get through the program. But um, she was good. And Johnson entered into some really interesting uh, dialogue with her. And uh, um, so... So the, the bottom line is that even though my undergraduate, undergraduates come into the course not really wanting to take theology, many of them really, when, when you allow them to think about the issues, I, I tell them I want them to think about the issues that theologians have to confront today and to try to think about that with me and see where we go from there. They, they really like that. And it's, it's, uh, it's much more open-minded than what they were used to getting. Um, yeah. You know, we're just telling them what they have to believe and what they have to that sort of dogmatic thing. They don't they don't want that and nobody does. They're authoritarian not gibberish, you know? So so yeah. I think I really appreciate that. You know, just getting inside the issues and allowing uh, allowing the issues to speak to them. You know, yeah. uh, I don't know, I hope oh. so. No, no, thank you. Uh we we lost of students at Princeton who actually went into um non profits and they were helped by their theological training. Um, Tom, um, we only have a small number of minutes left, but can I ask you, in a sense, to sort of wrap this up and um, try try to answer this question um, about 
you know, lots of our students are not going to get academic jobs, um, but how do they carry on this probing conversation, engaging with how Christianity is expressing itself? And um, I, I'm sorry, just, just one, one thing I would say, we're, we're looking at climate disaster, all sorts of things. But Dan Hardy, who taught you and who was a friend of mine, Dan always said that we as Christians can only confront evil with joy. Because it is only joy, and that is Christian joy, the joy of the cross, which can fundamentally change the situation. But let, let me turn to you now, Tom, um, and then we'll bring it to a close. It seems to me that Anna's question and this question actually about um, the sort of prospects for people really belong together, because if we are aware of the fact that we live in an ever more fractured, ever more individualized um, world, you know, if we recognize that some of the problems that we face are the problems of plurality and how we navigate those questions, those things are innately theological questions that require prior theological thinking and a good number of you know, my PhD students have gone on precisely to work in the third sector, to work in churches. And I'm delighted that in an age when we're confronting these sorts of issues, that actually we're going to have a generation of church leaders who are outstanding as theologians and who have, you know, learned deeply and thought deeply about these issues. I have a current PhD student training for Anglican ministry who is writing his thesis on, you know, how, how can Bart, Karl Barth speak to Generation Z, uh, which in some ways encapsulates some of the discussion that we've had. You know, what, what are the issues that people from Generation Z have? What things might they learn from Bart? What things can we carry from his theological insights that would be meaningful and helpful for that generation? And, and I'm really glad that this is somebody who is intending to have a, a parochial ministry and maybe will go on to be a bishop or something. Uh, one day. And I, I know that um, the job market is poor at the moment, but actually the low key in which theology can be done and the need for good theology to be done well in these different low key, you know, the, the, the public sphere, the churches, the political debate, the need for people who can talk from um, a deep foundation in uh, seeking to understand who Jesus Christ is and what he has to say to the world today. That that seems to me to be um, a, an immensely important and wise activity for people to engage in, even if they're not going on the career path that is PhD seminary. You know, great to have those people in politics and diplomatic yeah. relations <laughs> and charity and, yeah. uh, think tanks yeah. and so forth. Yeah, no, Tom, thank you. Thank you. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think another thing I'd say is, is is that, and say this also to Marty, is that Linda Woodhead, who who is a very great friend I'm, to me and to Tom, I know, um, Linda has in her recent Cadbury lectures talked about the shift from beliefs to values, and um, actually engagement in values is still a Christian conversation. Um, that the conversation is conducted, in a sense, in a different place and in a different way and against a different framework, but it is still um, a discussion into which Christians have a crucial contribution. Um, thank you. Thank you to all, all of you, to Paul and to Anna and to Hilda and to Tom. So thank you all. and. Um, um, happy 200th anniversary to TNT Clark and welcome to your third century. And yeah. Mm -hmm.